I'm James Crossley and I'm the Academic Director for the Centre for the Critical Study of Apocalyptic and Millenarian Movements. Uh, today we're here at uh, Smithfield, more particularly St Bartholomew the Great Church, and over there is St Bart's Hospital with a memorial to the Peasants' Revolt of 1381 and particularly uh, the figures John Ball and Watt Tyler. We're at the memorial itself now, and, I, and I'll read out what it, what it says. Um, at this place, on the 15th of June, 1381, Watt Tyler, John Ball, uh, and other representatives of the Great Rising met King Richard II to finalise terms for ending the rebellion. Uh, the King had agreed to all the political reforms aimed at uh, alleviating the plight of the people. However, he and his advisers later reneged on that agreement after killing Tyler in the process near this spot. John Ball and many others of the revolt were also later executed. Now, uh, that's the narrative of the revolt itself. And in between this uh, are words of John Ball. Now, it's, it's very questionable whether John Ball was actually here or not, but never mind. We'll read out the words attributed to him. Uh, and it's this. Things cannot go on well in England, nor ever will, until everything shall be in common, when there shall be neither vassal nor lord, and all distinctions levelled. John Ball. John Ball was the most famous priest to have emerged from the so-called Peasants' Revolt of 1381. The label Peasants' Revolt is probably misleading because the uprising also involved, among others, artisans, local officials, lower clergy, Londoners and town dwellers in uprisings elsewhere in the country. The uprisings were the culmination of years of social, economic and political discontent following the Black Death in the mid 14th century, as labourers were able to make greater demands following mass population loss. But there are also more immediate issues which sparked the uprisings, particularly involving taxation. The uprisings are typically associated with Kent, Essex and London, with Watt Tyler as the main leader but the uprisings were much more widespread than this. Nevertheless, John Ball became associated with the uprising in the southeast, though occasionally also associated with uprisings in East Anglia, though we can't always be certain about its precise whereabouts during the revolt. On Thursday the 13th of June 1381, the Feast of Corpus Christi, the rebels arrived in London and joined up with sympathetic Londoners and tried to get King Richard II to hear their demands. Rebels targeted political, economic, legal and ecclesiastical buildings in London and were, largely, disciplined in doing so, even punishing thieves and robbers. They also released prisoners from different jails, including prisoners held for reasons of debt. One of the most famous moments of the London Revolt was the arrival at the Savoy Palace, where they burnt it and destroyed an, uh, a range of fineries. The palace itself was owned by John of Gaunt, who was one of the most despised figures amongst the rebels, and hence it was deliberately targeted. Richard sailed from the Tower of London to speak with the rebels at Greenwich, and the rebels made it clear they wanted the heads of Richard's closest advisers. In the evening, Richard was said to have looked out areas of London in flames. Here at Mile End was one of the other key moments of the London Uprising. King Richard II was said to have met the rebels, including, according to one source, Watt Tyler, and there were demands made for the end of serfdom, and for the pardon of prisoners and, and outlaws. Richard agreed, and then some rebels were content and happy and went home, but not all, and these included Watt Tyler. Rebels were said to have got into the tower, and there they found some of the leading figures of the realm, most famously Simon Sudbury, who was Archbishop of Canterbury and Chancellor of England, and they chopped the heads off and paraded the heads on spikes. 
Wat Tyler was said to have gained another meeting with Richard at Smithfield, where he pushed for further demands. These were even more dramatic as they included the end of lordship as traditionally understood, and one bishop only for England. Richard seemed to agree, but in the confusion that followed, Tyler was fatally stabbed. Richard managed to convince the rebels he was on their side, and led them away to the Clark and Well fields. The London revolt was effectively over. Concessions were repealed, rebels were hunted down, and royal authority reimposed before the end of 1381. An example was made of leaders. John Ball himself was captured in Coventry, tried in St Albans in mid-July, and hanged, drawn, and quartered. So who was John Ball? There is little certainty about his birth and childhood. There is speculation that he might have been born in Peldon in Essex, and that he worked as a priest in the Church of St James the Great in Colchester. What we can say with a bit more certainty is that he was trained as a priest in York before becoming active in Colchester and Essex. We start to get more detail about his adult life because he kept getting into trouble. From 1364 onward, at least, Ball was a known itinerant preacher who riled the church authorities, sometimes escaping capture, sometimes not. He seemed to have had a long-running feud with Simon Sudbury, who was Archbishop of Canterbury at the time of the 1381 revolt, and who had imprisoned Ball on more than one occasion. As Ball was banned from preaching in church services, he was instead active in streets, squares, fields and cemeteries. For over 20 years it was said that Ball preached against the lords and church leaders, and was popular for doing so. He criticised their fine clothes, luxurious houses and good food, while the lower orders were in poor cloth, eating badly and working in wind and rain so that the Lord's estates could be maintained. Ball's solution was for the common people to remove the established aristocratic and church hierarchies, and the system put in its place would have one religious leader, namely Ball himself, a view which seemed to have commanded some popular support. As was recognised, this meant the present Archbishop of Canterbury, Ball's old nemesis Simon Sudbury, had to go. There is conflicting evidence about Ball's activities and whereabouts during the uprisings of 1381, but he soon became remembered for a sermon at Blackheath as rebels were closing in on London. Most famously, Ball was said to have preached a sermon on a proverb about Adam and Eve and about how the uprising was a fulfilment of expectations of radical historical change. As one chronicler put it, and to corrupt more people with his doctrine at Blackheath, where 200,000 of the commons were gathered together, he began a sermon in this fashion. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? Let them consider, therefore, that he, God, had now appointed the time wherein, laying aside the yoke of long servitude, they might, if they wished, enjoy their liberty so long desired. Wherefore they must be prudent, hastening to add after the manner of a good husbandman, tilling his field, and uprooting the tares that are accustomed to destroy the grain, first killing the great lords of the realm, then slaying the lawyers, justices and jurors, and finally rooting out everyone whom they knew to be harmful to the community in future. So at last they would obtain peace and security if, when the great ones had been removed, they maintained among themselves equality of liberty and nobility, as well as of dignity and power. There is an allusion to the parable of the wheat and the tares from Matthew's Gospel here. The parable talks about an enemy sowing weeds among the good seed and sorting and destroying the good weeds from the bad. The explanation in Matthew's Gospel is that the Son of Man sows the good seed and the good seed represents the children of the kingdom. Similarly, the devil sows the bad and the weeds are the children of the devil. Fittingly, the parable has an eschatological conclusion whereby the harvesting is the end of age and the angels will throw out the causes of sin and the evildoers. For Ball, it would be the labourers and lower orders who would benefit from this change. Cryptic letters attributed to Ball allude to those who work with flour and bread. He talks about such work as grinding, and how the King's Son of Heaven will pay for all. It's difficult to know what to do with the cryptic language, but one suggestion is that this is a reference to the labour involved in the bread of the Eucharist. The uprising in London, we recall, was on the Feast of Corpus Christi, the feast that was the celebration of the Eucharist and the body of Christ. 
This celebration would also have involved stories of the exodus from slavery under Pharaoh and the beneficiaries of Christ's sacrifice. And there should be little doubt who Ball thought would and would not be receiving any such benefits, who would and would not be beneficiaries of everything held in common.